We continue our lecture on the telegraph, telegraphers' equations with the frequency domain. How solutions to the telegrapher equations look in frequency domain. Uh, a problem with the time domain is that the solution of the complete telegrapher's equations are rather difficult. N uh, the, pro the, the solution is rather difficult, not just in the equation itself. Uh, these differential equations could be perhaps be solved, but the problem is that R and the G are usually uh, are not constant, especially R if this is a uh, metal loss is usually due to the skin effect, so this thing uh, is a function of frequency. G may also be a function of frequencies for most, most dielectrics. So these two are not constant. This, this, the uh, in distributed inductance and capacitance may be considered constant, but R and G are not constant with frequency. That's the reason why this is difficult to describe in time. And uh, that's the reason why we're going to consider these equations in the frequency domain. So let's see how to solve the same equations we have here in frequency domain. And again, we start with guessing the solution. Guessing the solution in a similar way as we solve uh, uh, in a similar way as, as we solve uh, uh, AC circuits, AC circuits in the steady state, so we replace the variable time with the, the uh, angular frequency omega, that's 2 pi, the standard frequency. And the solution for any phasor quantity u, this phasor is actually rotating at omega t, with the, uh, with the angle omega t, uh, t is time and omega is our frequency, and the same thing for the current, for the current also has omega t. Besides the term with time, in our guess we also add the term with k, where k is the angular wave number, or simply wave number k. Uh, this k uh, describes the behavior of our quantity with respect to the distance z. So if we go back here, we have uh, one variable over uh, of time, uh, variables of time here, and distance z is here along our line. Is this? Uh, we guess this solution. Now we try to put this solution into our equations. We guess both solutions, and uh, we hope the best. So we hope that the, our equations actually fit these solutions. If we calculate uh, derivatives over time, derivatives over time are always j omega, j omega. This equation is as the phasor level, so this uh, is actually a complex identity here. j omega is the derivative over time, and uh, uh, plus minus j k is the derivative over z. Uh, where here we may have both two signs, plus and minus. Why do we need two signs? We have uh, coupled differential equations. Two equations and two coupled differential equations should provide uh, a, se a single second order differential equation. And that second order differential equation should uh, give us, uh, the second order differential equation should give us uh, should give us two actual two linearly independent solutions and to have two linearly independent solution we need such a trick like, like plus and minus sign here. Now uh, the, uh, replacing derivatives this with multiplications make, uh, makes life much easier. Now we simply have to insert the second equation, the i from the second equation into the third equation. Third equation and uh, here we have this Things uh, this product here, uh, omega l j omega l over l minus r over l multiplied by j omega c over l minus g over l under uh, square root here, under square root and uh, plus minus is up here uh, uh, becomes minus plus. So there is yet another minus getting here. So uh, K, 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 K calculated here has yet, yet another, we get yet another uh, minus uh, down here. Um. 
and uh, uh, this thing can be uh, calculated now. Uh, so this this additional minus comes from j times j. j times j gives this minus sign here. j squared j squared is minus sign under the square root. And this uh, angular wave number uh, has a real part and has an imaginary part. This is a complex number because there are complex arguments on this square root. And beta is the phase constant uh, uh, expressed in radians per meter. Radians as phase angle per meter length. Phase angle per meter length times length. We get just the angle and a to j the angle. We give the, get the phase angle of the phaser in front of here. And uh, alpha is the attenuation constant. Uh, here I should add that this is amp amplitude attenuation. Some people also use power attenuation and then equations are a little bit different, different if you use power attenuation. Power attenuation is simply twice this value of alpha here, used in nepers per meter because alpha also goes into an exponential function. function. Uh, natural logarithm of a ratio is the ratio uh, expressed in nepers. Of course, uh, now we have k, we can calculate k out of here, and we can rewrite our complete solutions for both independ uh, linearly independent solution for the reflected wave and for the forward wave. Of course, forward wave has minus sign here and the reflected wave has plus sign plus kz up here. Where ur and ue, uh, uf are now arbitrary phasers. They are cons constant, but they are phasers. All the time dependence and the coordinate dependence is given in this function here. These two can be now contest. ur and uf can be constant phasers. Uh, the ratio between the voltage and current is given exactly in the same way as in the time domain, only because we are in the frequency domain, we uh, now no longer talk about the characteristic resistance, but about the characteristic impedance. This is the ratio of, for the forward wave, is just forward voltage divided by forward current, and it's minus reverse voltage divided by reverse current, because uh, in the reverse current has the opposite, opposite sign of the current. If we try to calculate this out, we simply use the first equation up here, first equation, and we put voltage and current of the same solution, of course, for instance, for the forward wave here. And uh, if we calculate this k, we put this value of k in here. Uh, uh, j will uh, cancel out, and the final uh, solution we get, we get here the characteristic impedance of the line. We get the characteristic impedance. Uh, characteristic impedance, well, if I talk about ohms, we think about it is real. No, it is not real. It is a complex number. The characteristic impedance in the frequency domain is always a complex number, but uh, its uh, its imaginary part can be rather small compared to the, uh, compared to the uh, real part of the impedance. Now, if we look at the real world case, so we have low loss frequency domains. This does not mean zero loss, but means that losses are low. Say we are trying to build a transmission line that has good copper wire with good conduct uh, conductivity and an excellent dielectric with very, very small losses here. If we have these two, uh, so uh, G over L goes to zero, distributed uh, uh, conductance goes to zero, distributed resistance is much small than this uh, uh, distributed impedance of the impedance of the inductance. Uh, uh, this equation should contain also omega here to be to make sense. Okay, we can uh, simplify the characteristic impedance and since this term R over L is very small, we can just simplify the characteristic uh, impedance to its real part. Its real part and j omega then cancels out if we neglect this r over l term here. And uh, we can just use the same formula as in the time domain. In the time domain, in the lossless time domain, we can also use in the low loss frequency domain, we can use the same formula with no problem. Uh, a little bit tricky is the wave, uh, uh, is the 
uh, angular wave number. The wave number is a little bit tricky because with the wave number we should not consider only beta, the phase constant. Uh, if the line has attenuation, then we want to know what the attenuation is, and we also try to calculate alpha. Okay, we put our numbers in the formula for the wave equation. Uh, we try to rearrange terms in this wave equation. To have in front of the square root have this constant term that's almost the wave number for the lossless case times a small correction, a small correction that's 1 minus j where this correction is very small because r over l is much smaller than omega l over l. So this correction is small and this correction is actually this correction is actually uh, imaginary. If now I take a square root, an approximate square root, so 1, one uh, 1 minus epsilon squared, if epsilon is small, is 1 minus epsilon half. Uh, an approximation for this square root is just this parenthesis here with this uh, uh, term 2 included here. The, this is actually the first term in the derivation of, in the evolution of a series, of a Taylor series from this square root here. This is just, I write just the first, the most important term. The most important and the second most important term here. So if I again rewrite these things, this one gives us one constant term here, and this lossy term gives, gives us an imaginary term here. If I try to calculate what this imaginary term here, so beta is just omega times the square root L over C, L over L times C over L, and this is just omega divided by V, by the velocity in this, uh, in this transmission line while uh, alpha is just the ratio of the uh, distributed resistance divided by twice the characteristic impedance. This is ohms, this is ohms per meter, so alpha has units ohms per meter or nepers per meter because neper is a lossless, uh, lossless uh, is a dimensionless, dimensionless unit, not dimensionless, uh, unitless unit. Uh, so, rewriting now my solution becomes with alpha and beta rather than k as we had before. Uh, alpha and beta, here we had the same solution written with k with the wave number. Here I have the same solution with, written with the phase content and the attenuation constant. And the phase constant, this is much more, much more useful for practical use in the, uh, in the frequency domain. So let, now let's try to make practical use of all the equations we actually derived here, right from the beginning, right from the beginning where we talked about the characteristic resistance in uh, uh, time domain, when we talked about the characteristic impedance in frequency domain, uh, characteristic impedance and simplifications for our thing. And uh, a go very good simplification that we can use is a coaxial cable. A coaxial cable has a round central conductor, a wire, a round wire, and a round shield conductor. This uh, uh, coaxial cable may be several millimeters in diameter, so A and B may be a few millimeters each. The place in between the two conductors is filled by the, the, uh, the electric with its permittivity, relative permittivity, epsilon r here. So now, what do we know about this cable? At high frequencies, like 100 megahertz, where the coaxial cables are usually used, copper has a penetration depth of just uh, about 7 micrometers. So this penetration depth, uh, drawn here as a red, red color and blue color, this penetration depth is small indeed, compared to A and B, compared to the size of the conductor and the shield. So uh, at high frequencies, most of the field is contained, of the cable is contained in the dielectric, both electric and magnetic field. There is almost no electric field and no magnetic field in the uh, central wire, not in the shield. And this makes uh, our life much easier because the induct, uh, the uh, distributed in inductance of such a cable is uh, just this simple formula, uh, taking in account just the magnetic field in the, the uh, dielectric. 
and the capacitance also has a similar simple formula uh, but this capacitance is also, also valid at DC because at DC we have no electric field in the conductors uh, another constant we use here is the free space impedance this is related to uh, this is uh, this simply replaces square root of mu zero divided by epsilon zero uh, and it's a well-known constant it's 2 pi times 60 ohm so uh, simplifying this it is just 60 ohm divided by the uh, square root of the permittivity of the dielectric times this natural logarithm of the ratio of the the wire to the uh, of the the ratio of the uh, shield radius divided by the wire radius. So this is the uh, standard formula for characteristic impedance of coaxial cable. But here we should also consider losses. And for losses, we said the electric can be made excellent. We have excellent we have losses, but we have a finite resistance that gives us finite alpha. And this finite alpha in nepers per meter uh, we calculate it from the formula we had on the previous slide and we simply calculate that the wire current uh, flows just on the on a very thin shell of a cylinder around the central wire and the uh, uh, shield current flow flows only on the uh, on a very thin cylinder on the inner side of the of the of the uh, shield here. So we calculate both resistances using that this uh, this thin uh, thin layers of current are have the thickness of delta this is the penetration depth that we have gamma is the conducti conductivity of copper and the geometry we have here. We can calculate from this alpha how it much and we can alpha given in nepers per meter given in numbers per meter uh, with a small trick here you see that I multiplied this side by B this expression by B and I divided by B down here so now I have the uh, loss the attenuation co uh, coefficient uh, the, the attenuation constant here the attenuation constant I have uh, it expressed on one side with just B and on the other side with the ratio B over A. So uh, what affects the cost of the cable? The cost of the cable certainly affects the, the outside uh, diameter of the cable to B. This affects the, the cost of the cable. Also, cables have a dielectric and this affects have some copper conductor. Z0 is a constant and have this ratio uh, b over a and this ratio b over a denoted here by x uh, this is actually a quantity we can choose by why when while building the cable because the cost is just this b here if i put a thicker wire in in the center it does not uh, change much okay so not what can we learn from this formula what about the attenuation of our cable the attenuation requires the lowest possible relative uh, permittivity of the media. Air is far the best, worse is foam, even worse is Teflon, even worse is polyethylene here. The higher the, the, uh, the permittivity of the material, the higher the losses. So we, we try to select this one the lowest possible. Usually there is yet another step here. It's possible also to use spacer. Uh, spacers have a small, smaller uh, average permittivity than foam. Foam here, Teflon foam, I mean. Also polyethylene foam, maybe. Uh, B is the cost of the cable, but what is what about B over one? B over one is uh, a parameter here, and actually this function in the numerator of this ratio here actually increases with b the, the, uh, the denominator also increases with b so it's a complicated function of this and we can look what happens about uh, with this choosing this ratio especially if we write this as x because x is our free variable now 
and if we try to calculate the loss not in nepers per meter this is a theoretical unit but in decibels per meter this is a much more practical unit that we do here let's see what happens here is a ratio b over a on this plot this was calculated and here is that attenuation per unit length already calculating the decibels per kilometer decibels per kilometer uh, for a uh, for any material and so we see that this curve has a pronounced minima here and the minima is ar around 3.6 the exact calculation is a transcendental equation and that gives 3.59112147 and so on uh, but for us for any practical purposes 3.6 it's an approximation that's good enough here so 3.6 is actually the value, the one which, which we are going to work with. 3. Point. And 3.6 is the value in this table here to see for a given dielectric, for a given permittivity, what we get about the optimum characteristic impedance. And we see that Teflon and polyethylene are quite close to 50 ohms. In fact, polyethylene was the reason why during the Second World War 50 ohm was chosen as the characteristic, standard characteristic impedance. If we are uh, building cable TV, we prefer to use lower loss cables because cable TV has big problems with cable attenuation. And we prefer to use foam. That's the reason why cable TV works with 60 ohm cables. Air gives even a higher impedance, but air cables do not work because there's no one to hold the central conductor in between. And also heat dissipation from the central conductor is now very, very bad here. So now let's see what can we do with cables. Uh, this is the actual loss written from the face page. Uh, the loss in decibels per unit length, so decibels per meter. An example, polyethylene, 3.2 millimeters, uh, radius of the central conductor, 2, 2 millimeters, radius of the shield, 7.2 millimeters, to keep the 3.6 ratio, we get 23 decibels per kilometer. And this is the theoretical length that's given by this conductivity of copper. Conductivity of copper and size of shield. These two numbers actually solving the equation get to this uh, this figure here of course uh, considering the frequency this is a function of frequency and this is actually the minimum we can get here 23 decibels per kilometer so we see that coaxial cables for long distances say for um, analog communications maybe 500 meters like for cable tv for digital transmissions like uh, uh, PDH telephony uh, was two kilometers the distance between two regenerators and that's that's a huge huge limit there is even some uh, another limit that people forget about and that's the maximum frequency a cable can transfer of course this uh, attenuation grows with the square root of the frequency you see the frequency here uh, four times the frequency twice the attenuation or ten times the frequency uh, one, uh, 100 times the frequency, 10 times the attenuation. Uh, there's a yet another limit, and that's then what, when our coaxial cable is supporting other modes besides the TEM mode. This was all written with the basic TEM mode, the fundamental TEM mode, TEM mode in the cable. If we have other waveguide modes in the cable, they will appear at about this frequency limit. Is so, this limit so speed of light divided by pi divided by sum of both radiuses and divided by the square root of the permittivity relative permittivity and for our cable 7.2 millimeter radius outside this is just this is less than 7 gigahertz so this limit is pretty pretty annoying here so this was just to demonstrate how do this equation work these equations how to work we are mainly interested in losses not even in the phase constant right now we are interested in what happens about loss because if we have too much loss we cannot have any communication that's that's a very simple explanation but now let's look at the other uh, things we can do we can calculate and an interesting problem is if we have a load connected to my line 
how does the impedance of this load transform into the impedance on the input connections of this line from z is equal to zero to z is equal to l if the line has a length l well it first makes sense to calculate the reflection coefficient uh, reflection coefficient here is a complex number because z is a complex number uh, this reflection coefficient can be also expressed as the ratio of the two voltages but the two voltages taken at the line and you see here beta l i could uh, cancel out omega t because it's cancelled out but beta l i could not cancel it and alpha l i could not also not cancel it because this is uh, phase constant and this is attenuation constant now, uh, if we express this, if I try to cancel out the unnecessary constant here, I get the ratio of the two voltages at the line beginning times uh, twice the phase constant, twice the phase angle, and times uh, square uh, attenuation squared, so twice, twice the attenuation in the exponent of this function. Or if I want to compute now the gamma prime at the beginning of the line, at the beginning of the line, the gamma prime is simply ur over uf, u reverse over u forward, without any constant because l is zero here and uh, uh, omega t cancels out. And this is uh, inverting this equation to get ur over uf. I get these same numbers, but with sign minus. So from gamma, I can com compute gamma prime, just taking in consideration the length of this line. Uh, it's phase constant and it's uh, attenuation constant, uh, all included in the wave number k. Here. Finally, if I want impedance, I can calculate impedance z prime from gamma prime, inverting a similar equation to this one here. Exactly the same what we did in... Uh, the time, dom uh, time domain, but in the time domain we were just in the steady state, we were with all real numbers, here all numbers are complex, all numbers are complex because z may be a complex impedance. Uh, something interesting about uh, z, if z is a passive load, then r is larger or equal to zero, and then uh, with, a real, with a real and positive zk, gamma is smaller or equal to 1. So gamma, uh, now the phasor of gamma resides inside the unity circle, the circle with the radius of 1 here. If we have uh, an active load with R be, uh, with negative, negative resistance, then we may have gamma also outside this circle. But having gamma inside a circle is very easy to make drawing, sketches, graphical calculations and so on. This is very, very useful to have it in a limited amount of space. And uh, uh, inserting a line, the delay, the beta L, simply rotates its gamma. Two beta L gamma rotates by two beta L, rotates in this direction, in the mathematically uh, negative direction because of this minus. And with alpha L, gamma going towards the source uh, reduces its amplitude, rotates and reduces its amplitude towards the source because it's minus alpha L here. So we see what do both of them do. Maybe um, there are many possible applications of this equation and because of lack of time I'm just uh, telling you the simplest possible applications here. And the simplest, someone, some very simple application is the uh, quarter wavelength uh, impedance transformer or uh, lossless impedance inverter. It's built by a lossless line, alpha is zero. Beta L is very short, pi over two. So this is 90 degrees actually in degrees. So a quarter wavelength length line will uh, change, will flip the sign of gamma or will uh, invert the impedance. The, inver uh, the Z prime is just the inverted value of Z uh, in the inversion, the point of inversion is ck squared. So this is just one of the interesting applications for the others. We don't have time here in this lecture. Uh, so because gamma is uh, such a useful quantity, it, uh, defined inside the unity circle, this unity circle is usually uh, frequently uh, draw, plotted uh, with all possible lines with uh, actually this equation up here 
The solution of this equation is actually plotted in the Smith chart. This Smith chart is normalized to the uh, characteristic impedance of 1 here. You see, uh, here is what is normalized. So this would be 50 ohms. And this would be 50 ohms plus J 50 ohms, this one up here. So I have a graphical solution of the equation up here. This is a graphical solution. And now I can, my gamma, if I know the phase angle, I can rotate it. And uh, I need even not know what is gamma. I just uh, uh, read the impedance here and then I read the impedance here. So a completely graphical tool. And this Smith chart was sold for many years uh, as a graphical tool, as a graphical calculator to calculate, uh, calculate uh, circuits using uh, distributed components. Uh, this is a, it was, a, today it's not that long, so much useful as a tool because computers can, can calculate this. But uh, to have a physical representation of, of the operation of a certain circuit, uh, the Smith chart is still very useful. Also to plot curves of uh, different components like semiconductors uh, operating at high frequencies, the, uh, the Smith chart is a very useful, very useful component. And it's, it's a notation and the Smith chart is actually the symbols, so the symbol of all engineers working at radio and microwave frequencies. Uh, what we didn't talk, we didn't talk about with uh, uh, in the uh, frequency domain about powers. So power is usually calculated the complex power here. Here I mean the complex, not just the real part of it, but the complex power is voltage times uh, uh, current conjugated. Conjug and the conjugation sign is this asterisk here. So I write down the expression for the whole voltage. I write down the expression of the whole current when I have both reflected waves here and forward waves here. What do I get out? So this forward times this forward gives me the forward power. This is the real power, the real forward power, the active power on my load. Uh, the active power traveling in the forward direction. Of course, this power is decaying by twice the attenuation coefficient because the line is attenuating the power. The reflected power is given by the multiplication of this UR times this UR. And this, this gives me the reflective power with the opposite sign. The reflective power goes the opposite way, goes back from the load. And also this uh, attenuation constant now has the opposite sign because this actually uh, decays towards the generator, so increases towards the load. And then we have a mixed product, so UR times UF and this UF times this UR. This mixed product can be combined into a sign, uh, into a term that is uh, completely reactive. It has J here. So this means reactive power. And this is actually the energy stored in the standing wave. This is something new, something we didn't expect here. Uh, we shall see uh, uh, standing waves in the, in the following. Uh, I have here a simple, uh, simple, uh, a very simple, uh, animation of standing waves to describe these things. Of course, if we talk about real power, we can forget about the standing waves. It's just uh, the real power minus the reflected power or considering the attenuation constant here. Uh, all the phases disappear here under this absolute sign, but the attenuation stay here. The reflected power is just the forward power times gamma squared because it goes with the square of the reflectivity of the load. And uh, all the active power is just the uh, forward power, 1 minus reflective power, 1 minus gamma squared. Here. If uh, we have a lossless case, then this z vanishes here. So we're just working with constant here. I should calculate all the constant, uh, all the quantities at the exact coordinates here. Uh, uh, talking about standing waves, we always we can reflect when we have reflection, when we have a sine wave drive, we have standing waves. But in the lossless case only, standing waves have a ratio. This ratio is usually defined as a voltage standing wave, could be also here a current standing weight. So the American term here is standing wave ratio, maybe voltage standing wave ratio, or the Greek red letter row in other languages, 
uh, for the standing wave ratio. This is the, the ratio over the maximum voltage of the uh, the maximum uh, s uh, amplitude of the voltage over the line in a certain point, and then another certain certain point we have may have the minimum of the voltage. Of course, in order the maximum and min maxima and minima to appear, we have to have some reflection. One plus absolute value of gamma is uh, uh, maximum voltage and minimum voltage one minus gamma. This uh, standing wave ratio spans between one. One is perfect matching, no gamma, act up to infinity. Infinity with gamma absolute is equal to one. Then we reach infinity. We can also make the uh, reverse calculation from the we can get from the from the uh, standing wave we can get the gamma here from the standing wave uh, and the gamma here is uh, for a passive load uh, we should separate two different expression for the passive load and for the active load because we don't know anything about the phase of gamma here the absolute value has even eaten everything so for the passive load gamma is less than one and of course is more than one for the active load. not more than we can but, but more than one more than one should be a better expression here more than one for an active load here for gamma so now let's see what how how to do an animation of this i promised the animation so i wrote a, a simple program here i wrote a simple program to make this animation and maybe you can try this program also on your computers you need python for this animation uh, you need some libraries for python numpy for uh, mathematical calculations very efficient and matplotlib uh, for plotting pictures né? And now we can try uh, to put here some values, for instance, to simulate our waves. Let's put gamma zero, so perfectly matched load, and put attenuation also zero. We save this file and we run the program. We run the program and here is this uh, wave with uh, in a lossless line, so we have zero attenuation uh, normalized here should be normalized normalized here and uh, uh, we see that uh, it's a sine wave with a constant amplitude traveling from the generator to the load we have actually on this scale if we have load at the coordinate zero and distance beta z goes to the negative to the negative values towards the generator so generator is minus 20 uh, minus 20 radians of beta zero from load we see that the wave is traveling from the generator to the load now uh, the next thing let's try to put in here some attenuation let's try to put here some attenuation so we see what happens if we have attenuation save I again I execute the program and see what happens with attenuation with attenuation I'm plotting here my wave my wave is propagating from the generator towards the load the load has no uh, reflection here reflectivity is zero so there is no reflected wave on this but i can draw here the envelope the envelope uh, the wave is actually sneaking under the envelope of this wave here and uh, uh, it's exactly touching the positive envelope and the negative envelope uh, here so we see what happens if we have uh, if you have here if we have a uh, attenuation order if I put larger attenuation the wave will be more da more dampened twice larger attenuation uh, so should first stop here save uh, I run it once again I put a larger attenuation you see that uh, the the wave has decreased much more than it has decreased before for a much larger, larger ratio has decreased towards the towards the load. Okay, so now let's clear the attenuation, 
and let's try to put a small reflection on the load. So now we have no attenuation, loss freeze case, but reflected load from the load. Reflected from, from load from the load, what happens now? Again we have this wave. This wave is again sneaking under the, its envelope. This envelope actually we now call it the standing wave. So this is the traveling wave, for red, red uh, line here is forward wave and backward wave, the traveling wave, and the green wave is the standing wave. The standing wave, why? Because it stands uh, at the same point, it does not move. This up here is the actually the standing wave. Its negative value is just plotted for uh, for clarity down here so that we see that also the the negative peaks also form the standing wave. Where is now the standing wave ratio? The standing wave ratio is counting from zero here, the distance to the lowest point uh, and the distance, the distance to the highest point, this amplitude here, divided by the U maximum is here, U minimum is here, so U maximum divided by the U minimum, this is our standing wave for the load. This is the typical example what happens in a line that has low loss and in fact many years ago they had slotted lines so they could measure uh, the actual voltage along the line and get this uh, green curve with relatively simple, simple laboratory means. If I put now a higher reflectivity of the load, say I put here 0.7, reflectivity save, and we run up the 0.7 example. Uh, you see what happens? Still the wave is uh, sneaking under the, its envelope. Still it is moving towards the load. But uh, this uh, standing wave has a much higher ratio of uh, U maximum, U maximum here 1.7, U minimum is 0 0.3, so this ratio is much larger. And you see that actually the standing wave it does not have a sinusoidal function, it's not a sine function. The traveling, uh, the standing wave is never a sine function, it maybe looked approximate in the previous solution, but not now. Since we have gamma positive here, we have a voltage maximum at the line end. Okay, we can try the opposite. We can try here to put negative gamma, negative gamma, and put, say, even a larger gamma, minus 0.9. Save. Let's try now this uh, animation here. How does it go? Works. You see, we now we have a much A much larger ratio between U maximum and U minimum. This, this ratio is here very large if you think that zero is here. You see now you can clearly see that the standing wave is not a sine wave. Only the the, for, uh, the traveling wave propagating under the uh, under the envelope, uh, sneaking under the envelope, is a sum of two sine waves. One propagating towards the load, the other one propagating back from the load. Uh, now we can try yet another thing. What, what happens if we have an active load? An active load has the gamma larger than 1. Like an active load of 2, for example. Let's try the active load from 2 if we get something useful here. Now we have a load that reflects more power than it received. Still a lossless case, uh, normalized line attenuation is zero, but, uh, but we reflect more power than received. What happens with the wave? The wave still sneaks under this envelope of the standing wave, but very, very different. The way the most of the power now travels from the load back to the generator because the load reflects more power than it generated. Such loads uh, are a little bit difficult to make, but they do exist. Like many microwave uh, components, 
active components like tunnel diodes, gun elements, impact diodes actually have a negative resistance and they reflect more wave, more, more power than they receive so they can act as amplifiers, as oscillators. So this is something that we actually use in the microwave region. Okay, so now let's try both. Let's try both. So try uh, gamma, a known gamma, like gamma 0.5 here, and try a non-zero, non-zero attenuation constant. Let's see when we have both gamma at attenuation. You see that in this case we still have most of the power traveling from the uh, generator to the load because something is reflected from the load but then that's not particularly large here. This reflected power is not particularly large. Uh, but you see that the standing wave now has minima and maxima but uh, not two minima are identical and not two maxima are identical. That's the reason why with a, on a lossy transmission line it's impossible to define the standing wave ratio. The standing wave ratio as we had it on our, in our lecture here, the standing wave ratio, uh, is only defined for alpha is equal to zero. Otherwise we don't know which maxima to use or which minima to use. Uh, so this one then this one. Uh, so maybe this can be better seen if I put a little bit a smaller attenuation but and a higher gamma, uh, higher gamma like 0 0.7 here, uh, 0 0.7 and uh, the load is 0 0.5. Uh, the attenuation constant with a smaller attenuation constant maybe it will be easier to see this effect now on the uh, So now we have higher reflectivity of the load and uh, lower attenuation constant. You see here that all the minima are different of the standing wave, all the maxima are different. So what's the reason of this story? Standing wave always exists. A standing wave always exists. The question is whether we can define its uh, uh, its uh, its uh, uh, its ratio, whether the standing wave ratio can be defined. In this picture we don't know which maximum to, you, to take and we don't know which minimum to take, so here the standing wave ratio on this picture is undefined. We have the standing wave, this is the green, the green line, but we don't have the standing wave ratio. This is important to understand out of all this discussion. You can try this example at home, you're trying different uh, different uh, examples but remember remember to load on your computer python maybe python 3 but work, should work also with python 2 in a similar way uh, numpy and matplotlib usually matplotlib already installs numpy for its own purposes so this is very efficient when calculating such an animation that requires a really, really large number of, of uh, computations okay that's about uh, the story about uh, 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 I should have turned off this one, then uh, this one turned off. Okay, we are again with our calculations. So, standing wave, we always have standing wave, it's always here. But standing wave ratio, it's only defined that alpha is zero. This was what I wanted to tell you from my animation. So, one final uh, subject for today. Uh, we can extend actually the reflection coefficient gamma to not just one port devices like a load here was one port device but to two port devices like two port networks a network that has two ports one and two and here uh, with two port networks uh, we define we can describe these two, two port networks with different sets of parameters where usually these, uh, these parameters are a matrix two by two of say impedance parameter z or conductance parameter uh, admittance parameter y or um, abcd parameters and one of these parameters are also reflection parameter uh, scattering parameters scattering parameters contain 
two reflective coefficients s11 is the reflection on the port one when port two is terminated uh, s22 is the reflection on port two when port one is terminated on characteristic impedance so s11 and s out these two uh, scattering parameters are usually called reflection parameters and we also have transmission parameters so we have transmission parameter us12 if we apply a match generator on port 2 what signal do we have on the match load on port 1 and uh, vice versa when we apply a generator on port 1 what signal do we get on the match port 2 and this that's 2 1 so uh, actually uh, if I talk about uh, amplifiers, this is actually the gain of the amplifier. The gain of the amplifier expressed as a voltage ratio. Uh, this is the reverse gain of the amplifier. Uh, this is the input match of the amplifier and the output match of the amplifier. So these scattering parameters uh, are very useful quantities and we have uh, lots of test equipment designed especially to measure these parameters. Uh, the same way as we had here the reflectometer bridge and effect. The reflectometer bridge operating in the frequency domain is a part of the circuit that's required to measure to measure uh, the input match and the output match of an amplifier. For the transmission we simply apply a generator here and a voltmeter here or a generator here and a voltmeter here to have forward gain and reverse gain. Of course now much depends on what the voltmeter can do. Can the voltmeter measure only amplitude or is it a vector voltmeter that can measure amplitude and phase? If it's a vector voltmeter, then we can make a vector network analyzer that can measure the whole phasers of this S parameter because S parameters, scattering parameters, had both, all of them have magnitude and phase. This is more to explain our experiments and the lab. Uh, in the laboratory exercises just to add this subject uh, in the course now of uh, the telegrapher's equation on the telegrapher's equation because this is also part of it now there are many possible calculations that can be done with s parameters we, we will simply neglect here because we don't have the time to do these things that's all for today